highest winds ever recorded on Earth. In a winter world above treeline, a few men not only withstood the maelstrom, they documented it for science. Today, the work is carried on by a new generation of weather watchers who have made a year-round home for themselves on the summit of the Northeast's highest peak. Mount Washington is located at the juncture of three major storm tracks and has long been known as home of the world's worst weather. There is a certain majestic beauty to New Hampshire's presidential range at any time of the year, but it is during the winter that nature's elements work their magic. creating surreal sculptures and landscapes that literally and figuratively take one's breath away. This is the world of the Mount Washington Observatory. And it has changed very little since the first pioneer observers took their measurements in 1870. An enterprising Yankee raised an observation tower on the summit in 1854, but tore it down with some help from the elements shortly thereafter. It wasn't until 1870 that a small group of scientists and adventurers took up residence in this lonely outpost. And there began the formal record of the weather atop Mount Washington. Into this hostile environment came a small expedition, led by C.H. Hitchcock and J.H. Huntington, hoping to survive and measure the fierce Arctic-like conditions. These weather watchers worked alone at the top of their world. As the U.S. Signal Corps kept their records from 1870 through 1892, they encountered and recorded many of the same phenomena that today's observers contend with. One journal entry in January 1875 noted a few of the special challenges that were calmly faced. January 27, 1875. Coldest of the season, 46 below. The wind is blowing a hurricane and has done so all through the night past. Had work today to keep warm. The wind and cold penetrate every cranny. Enormous drifts of snow have formed about the building, and as fast as the passage is cut out and the windows cleared, the wind drives in snow to fill up the gaps. The coal is far from being good. It is full of rocks and clinkers respectfully suggests that good coal and another heating stove be purchased. If such weather as this is to continue, it would be wicked to keep men in such a dwelling. Sergeant Isaac Burke. In the summertime, the mountain was exceptionally busy, with the Mount Washington Carriage Road and Cog Railway offering travelers a chance to see the summit and the surrounding peaks. A first-class resort hotel, the Tip Top House, and a host of wooden structures, including the weather building, comprised this city among the clouds. The world's only newspaper ever published on a mountaintop, among the clouds, told of daily life at the grand hotels and, of course, the weather. Visitors came from around the nation to sample a taste of life above treeline. Those days came to an end on June 18, 1908, as every important structure, save for the tip-top house, burned to the ground. As one era ended, another began. Gradually, the summit community took shape again, and it required more than two decades and a new generation of rugged North Country weather watchers to reestablish an observatory. These were the men who staked a new claim for the study of meteorology on Mount Washington. Alex McKenzie, Bob Monahan, Joe Dodge, and Sal Pagliuca. In 1932, they were the team that undertook the year-round reoccupation of the summit and began the scientific process of recording the weather that continues to this day. This recorded interview with the late Joe Dodge recounts the circumstances that led to the formation of the new Mount Washington Observatory. For years, we had anticipated uh, knowing what went on up on the top of Mount Washington, similar to what had happened there way back in the 1870s, when uh, Hitchcock and his uh, friends established the first uh, observatory on Mount Washington. Winter of 32, 33 were to be the 50th anniversary of the first international polar year. 
and uh, Bob Monahan uh, was staying with me that winter. Be because of this uh, announcement, Monahan and I decided, well, Tingles, this is a real uh, reason to establish an observatory on Mount Washington. After Dodge gave a presentation at the annual New Hampshire Academy of Science meeting, $400 in seed money was appropriated for the fledgling observatory. Soon thereafter, he, Monahan, Mackenzie, and Pagliuca amassed all that was needed to get started on the summit. And, uh, well, all this equipment became available, and we appealed to all the purveyors that I was mixed up with in the Appalachian Club to give us uh, some food and some various other items. Uh, we, we came back from Boston with a couple of truckloads of stuff. Life on the summit in 1932 was far from luxurious, as radio operator McKenzie remembers. I guess that it was a different world, and uh, there's nothing to brag about or nothing to apologize for. We, we just lived differently. And especially in the first winter, 1932-33, uh, we walked up and down the mountain and carried our belongings with us, anything that was personal and uh, valuable. Uh, we had to make almost all of the radio equipment, which of course is my job, uh, with our own tools, which I brought up there, and uh, the parts that we might need that had to be carried on our backs. Life was very uncomplicated. There were no shift changes such as they have now. There was no time off, obviously, and no pay. So it was very, very simple. Uh, we had no water up there but we melted snow and ice and uh, rime for water, and we occasionally drank it. And as for showers, no showers, of course. We had no privacy because, of course, uh, there wasn't room enough. Everybody slept in the, in the kind of bunk room up there. Our mail was read to us by Joe over the radio, and if there was anything that sounded as if it were going to get personal, we'd say, Joe, why don't you uh, just send that up? Uh, you couldn't be married and work on the mountain. As simple as that. That was Joe's rule, and he was the boss. And really, it didn't make much difference to most of us because uh, we didn't know many girls anyway. And uh, uh, the girls who were smart enough to climb the mountain were too smart to marry us because we didn't have any money. So it was during the Depression, and uh, we were very lucky, all of us, to have a place to sleep, and food that we could cook up into meals. So we lived out the depression that way. The years passed, and on April 12, 1934, the logbook entry told the story of the day that the highest winds ever recorded on Earth blew over the summit. Chief meteorologist Sal Pagliuca wrote, we had been taking turns knocking ice from the anemometer post. Shortly after 1 a.m., I set out to clear the ice again and disappeared into the fog on the roof. I felt the full blast of the 200 mile per hour southeast wind on my face. Kneeling on the platform, I pounded the foot thick ice accumulation with all my strength. But alas, I wasn't making much impression on the rough frost. New buildings went up and came down and the Mount Washington Observatory went about the arduous business of recording the weather. Over the years, a wide range of experiments were conducted on everything from wind towers and jet engines to winter clothing and paint. Today's observers no longer have to carry everything up on their backs. The LMC Sprite carries passengers and cargo through drifts and 100 plus mile per hour winds. Following the snow-covered Mount Washington auto road to the top, the Sprite will plow its way through the toughest drifts. Staff meteorologist Ken Rancor doubles as the Sprite driver, and in his more than 10 years of working on the summit, he has negotiated this small machine through some of the worst conditions imaginable. The observatory and the TV station that are both here on the summit uh, share a problem, and that is access. The only real access we have is up and down the auto road, which has to be at least opened one time a week to change shifts.
Now, these snow vehicles do travel under quite adverse conditions. Uh, winds over 100 miles an hour can be handled by the machines. Uh, the other thing is that when we say, for instance, we plow out the road, we're not really plowing it down like you'd see a highway in the valley. All we're doing is leveling it, leveling it up so the machine is not tipped too much so it's going to slide off the side of the mountain. Arriving at the summit on a clear winter day reveals infinite panoramas and an ice-coated world comprising the WMTW transmitting facility, the old tip-top house, and the observatory building. It is within these concrete walls that the men find shelter from the Arctic temperatures. Measurements are all recorded in the weather room, which is manned 24 hours per day. The weather room is the room where all of our outside interactions really take place. In here we record temperature, pressure, wind speed, wind direction, a lot of other parameters about the building, and other research programs have their data readouts in the weather room. This room is also the place from which the most listened to weather report in New England emanates. Good morning, Bob. How are you doing this morning? Our forecast for today, uh, we have a winter storm watch in effect for this afternoon through Tuesday. Today, we will be looking for cloudy skies with uh, snow and mixed rain to begin possibly uh, just after noontime. Highs will be 35 to 40. Winds will be out of the south at 10 miles per hour. Tonight, snow may mix with rain in the valley. The overnight low. These precision instruments measure a wide variety of conditions and are closely monitored. But every three hours, someone must get bundled up to make outdoor observations. This takes place round the clock. in every adverse condition. There are times when you can get hit by flying ice, by ice breaking off of the instruments, or even in the worst situation, slipping and falling and being caught outside under high wind conditions when you really can't even crawl back to the door. So knowing what's going on outside is very critical. even in a place that can disappear before your very eyes. A rare breed of winter hiker can occasionally be spotted before vanishing into the mist. The personal challenge of hiking up Mount Washington in winter is one that has long been met by hearty souls. Well, it's, uh, it's great to be out here in the wintertime. A day like this, it's tremendous. <laughs> It's a bit of personal challenge, and uh, just being here in the hills in the snow, wonderful. It, uh, it kind of sets you apart from the rest of the crowd, I think. Uh, I have about 60 pounds on my back and uh, carried it about four and a half miles today, and probably have another three or so to get out of here. Visiting researchers occasionally use the mountain facility for special experiments. Throughout the changing conditions, fleeting glimpses of the sun can give pause for reflection to even the most scientifically minded researcher. As the weather signals indicate that a storm is in the making, the pace and the pulse of summit life quicken. Mount Washington Observatory Director, Guy Goslin. When the weather begins to build like this, you, uh, you become very aware of uh, your dependence upon having something between you and it, some kind of cocoon, whether it's a building or uh, your clothing or whatever, something to separate you from the elements. And that, that separation, of course, is never complete, uh, so you remain always aware of the weather, that things are happening and uh, of the uh, 
potential in it for some kind of danger, but that's part of the attraction of working here. Nobody uh, uh, who has uh, worked up here has failed to feel the uh, uh, awe and respect that comes with really severe weather. Severe weather is, uh, is weather that can't be ignored. In an environment like this, you find yourself uh, very much in tune with your workmates. Uh, in one way or another, uh, you're all, in a sense, uh, celebrating the weather. That sort of bond extends also to our membership. For one reason or another, they have either fallen in love with this place or developed some kind of affinity for it themselves and uh, feel very strongly about Mount Washington and occupy the summit more or less through us in some regard. And uh, I would have to say that, uh, uh, that that feeling extends also for us, that feeling of bond extends also for us to those individuals who were here long before us observing the weather back in the uh, 1870s and 80s and 90s. And uh, we have them very much on our minds when we uh, go about our business up here because even more than, uh, or far more, I should say, than is a concern for us, it was for them a concern to, uh, uh, to survive in a place like this. Today's crew and visiting researchers do indeed share the camaraderie of mutual enthusiasm for the weather. The installation of an experimental new pitot tube design for measuring the winds, or the dinner table at the end of a long workday, are all part of the observatory experience. As the world below sleeps, the world above keeps one eye open. At least one observer will watch through the night, keeping his lonely vigil, listening to the voices of the wind tell their tales. While the frosty fingers of ice have created a life-sized outdoor sculpture garden, the hands of man have crafted a museum of summit life. The displays include a representation of many of the creatures who have carved out a life for themselves on the slopes of Mount Washington, as well as a painstakingly preserved collection of rare alpine flowers. Man-made treasures from a bygone era can also be found along the museum's walls. During a lighter moment, the OBS crew even produced a home video which is a real takeoff on table-side service. A small piece of the summit has come down to the valley in the form of the Mount Washington Observatory Visitor Center in North Conway. The new building makes an important collection of White Mountain historical material accessible and serves as a tangible reminder of the ongoing public service role played by this venerable mountaintop institution. There are times, especially at night or in the fog, when the past and present of the summit seem to mingle in the cool air. Times when the distance between then and now seems close enough to touch. There are evenings when the wind seems to carry its own memories of other observers who have made the lonely climb into the darkened sky to free the instruments of ice. It seems there will always be people willing to challenge themselves and the elements. Willing to do a job in the middle of winter, in the middle of nowhere, just for the sake of being there.
even as you watch this program, an observer is making measurements in the world above treeline. Marking time and charts and waiting for the next peak gust on the top of Mount Washington.